<laughs> okay. Good evening and welcome to another cooperative effort by the David Horowitz Freedom Center and the Children of Jewish Holocaust Survivors to bring to the community vital and timely information by respected and renowned experts. Tonight we are very proud to present our guests, Itamar Marcus and Nan Jacques Zilberdick of Palestinian Media Watch. Palestinian Media Watch is an Israel-based media watchdog organization. Established by Itamar Marcus in 1996, PMW monitors Palestinian Arabic media and school books. Palestinian Media Watch documents the contradictions between the image the Palestinians present to the world in English and the messages to their own people in Arabic. It documents incitement to anti-Jewish and anti-Israel violence on Palestinian media, distributing translations of Palestinian programs into English. The Palestinian broadcasts have been described as deeply shocking in their medieval style, bigotry towards an open incitement to violence and murder of Israelis and Jews. Since Palestinian television is heavily funded by the European Union, PMW translates and disseminates their broadcasts to make the European public aware of what kind of programs they are funding. PMW is credited with bringing to world attention the Hamas children's television program, Tomorrow's Pioneers, in which a Mickey Mouse-like character urges children to murder Jews. Itamar Marcus is director of Palestinian Media Watch. Previously, Itamar was a member of the Israeli delegation to the trilateral American, Israeli, and Palestinian Committee to monitor incitement. Established under the Y Accords, he has lectured at conferences and at universities and to senior security officials worldwide. He gives analysis on CNN, Fox News, BBC, and the full range of world TV news. Nan Jacques Zilberdick is a senior analyst at Palestinian Media Watch. Ms. Zilberdick focuses her research on the opinions and messages of the Palestinian leadership as transmitted to the Palestinian public with an emphasis on the impact of our Palestinian education on peace, messages, and values communicated to children and the glorification of terrorists. In addition, she also researches the misuse of foreign aid by the Palestinian Authority to promote hatred and terror. She lectures on Palestinian society in English, Hebrew, and Danish and holds an MA in Israel Studies and Communications from the University of Copenhagen and the, Uni and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Once again, we thank the Lux Hotel for their generosity and graciousness in providing us with this beautiful venue for this important presentation. Itamar and Nan will take questions following their presentation. At this time, please turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices. And now, with great honor, I introduce to you Itamar Marcus, and Nan Jacques Zilberdick. Palestinian Media Watch was founded 14 years ago with the goal of finding out what the Palestinian Authority was saying to their own people in Arabic. Not hearing? Some way to turn up the sound on the mic? Okay, start again. Palestinian Media Watch was founded 14 years ago. The goal was to find out what the Palestinian Authority was saying to their own people in Arabic. Till that point, we knew it was being said in English, we knew it was being said to the media and to negotiators. We wanted to know what was being said in Arabic. And in particular, we wanted to know what was being said to Palestinian children. Because we believe that what Palestinians teach their children is both their honest, authentic beliefs and opinions, and what they teach their children is going to determine if we have peace in the next generation. Now, to this end, we have been studying all of Palestinian society, whatever we could find through the media window. The media for us is not the end, the media is the window. We study sports pages, we study about culture, we study about music videos, we study about education, all trying to get a total picture of what's happening in Palestinian society. Now, just by way of introduction, I want to start off with some examples from the sports pages. And I start with sports because sports are so innocent. People imagine what could be problematic in the sports pages of a newspaper. Here I want to show you what we're finding in Palestinian press. Here's an article about a soccer tournament named the Abdel Basit Udeh Championship Cup. 
Who is Abdul Basir Udeh? He was the suicide terrorist who blew himself up at the Passover Seder a number of years ago, killing 31 Israelis. Each team in the tournament was named after a different terrorist. The article ended that the brother of the Shaheed, the martyr, the main terrorist, distributed the trophies. This entire tournament was revolving around glorifying suicide terror. We also had from the sports pages, summer camps, named after people like Wafa Idris. Wafa Idris was the first woman suicide terrorist. We had summer camps named after Ayat al Akhras, who was a 17 year old girl suicide terrorist, the youngest suicide terrorist. We had a boxing tournament last year named after one of the planners of the Olympic massacre. Uh, and we had a football tournament just a few months ago named after Wafa Idris, who was the first female suicide bomber, and this was a football tournament for youth. So all of this is happening through sports in the Palestinian Authority. And in addition, this past year, we had a football tournament named for Abu Jihad, uh, and we had a basketball tournament named for Abu Jihad as well. Abu Jihad, one of the masterminds of dozens of terror attacks, also one of the masterminds of the hijacking of a bus in 1978, in which 37 Israelis were killed. These are the people that are being rolled up. So what we're seeing here is that sports, in addition to being entertaining, and in addition to being recreation, sports is also role modeling. It's telling Palestinian youth, these people are your heroes. These people are your role models. These are people that you should try to emulate. So this is the problem, even in the sports pages of the Palestinian media, we are finding out things about Palestinian society that are very, very problematic. All of these examples that I've shown you have nothing to do with Hamas. Everything we're going to show you tonight is completely Fatah. Palestinian Authority, the mainstream in the Palestinian Authority. Now, one of the critical things that we have been following and that you just heard about uh, is a tactic of deception. To the media, to the world in English is one message, to the other people is, is another. In Arabic there's another message. And I want to show you, for example, one of the words, one of the statements of Hillary Clinton and how significant this is. This, this message of deception. Hillary Clinton said in Congress the following, we will only work with a Palestinian Authority government that unambiguously and explicitly accepts these principles, commitment to nonviolence, recognition of Israel, and acceptance of the roadmap which includes the cessation of all kinds of incitement. So the Palestinian Authority has committed to recognition of Israel, stopping hate incitement, and stopping violence. But I want to show you, and not only that, and not only they committed to it, Hillary Clinton said, we will only work with them if they do these three things. In other words, these are not final status issues. These are preconditions to be accepted as a partner in a peace process. And I want to show you just how the Palestinian Authority has treated these three commitments uh, to the international community. First, I want to show you something on educational television about the first topic of recognition. Recognition, the Palestinians claim in English that they recognize Israel, but their claims are the West Bank, Jerusalem, and, and the Gaza Strip. I want to show you what they teach their own people. This is a, an educational children's program, one of dozens like this. What's striking about this is the children are asked to name the most important port and all of the choices are actually Israeli ports. They're supposed to be defining something in Palestine and yet it's all Israel. This is the message in the Palestinian education to its children to see a world literally in which Israel doesn't exist. Another interesting example. In English, Palestinians say they're against the occupation and they say that they consider Jerusalem and the West Bank occupied. Look what they teach their own people and especially their children. Okay, we hope that all children, Palestinian children, will be able to go to the occupied territories. And what cities is she talking about? 
all Israeli cities. Again, total change of message. To the outside world, we're worried about the occupation West Bank. To the inside world, the occupation is all of Israel. There is no recognition of any legitimacy to any part of Israel in Palestinian education. Here you have another fascinating example of this. This was a special quiz that appeared on Palestinian TV during last year's Ramadan. Every year, they interviewed people and they would get a hundred dollar prize if they had the right answer to the following question. Okay, so the first thing we learn is that if you're ever on a game show, you want this to be your host. <laughs> but beyond that, beyond that, what's so significant here is that the Palestinian Authority is reinforcing this message daily. Every single day during the Ramadan, they had the same question over and over and over again. And, and what's critical about that is, this is not something passive. This is an ongoing indoctrination to see and to imagine a world in which there is no state of Israel. Another fascinating example, an important example, because here you see in this audience is Mahmoud Abbas and listen to what they're singing. And this is just about two months ago, uh, an event in the Palestinian Authority. goes on and on and on. So here you have an event with the entire echelon, the leadership of the upper echelon of the Palestinian Authority, and they're singing about all of Israel essentially being part of Palestine. I'll give you one final example to show how explicit this can be. Just about a month ago on Palestinian TV, they played this song. Jaffa Akko Haifi goes on, sings another three, four minutes, mentions all about eight or nine different cities in Israel. They're all Palestinian, they're all ours. So this is the message internally. No recognition, everything is ours. You will never hear them say this in Washington, because in Washington they would not be accepted with that kind of a message. Now, in addition to this, in culture and in education, we see identical messages and maps all over the place. So for example, here is a map in a Palestinian school book. This is Palestine, and as you see, it covers all of Israel. Likewise, in this map from a school book, here we have from a Palestinian, the, the Palestinian newspaper that's owned by the PA. This is a few months ago, we see the map. And we see above the map over here, we see the flag of the Palestinian Authority. Here we see an official Fatah symbol. The, the political statement of jurisdiction here by having the flag over all of Israel. And like I say, this is official Fatah uh, symbol. This is on Palestinian television just about two weeks ago. Here you've got the word Palestine, again with the flag. There's no hiding. 
uh, from their people. Uh, on their websites, you get the identical message. Here's the Palestinian territory. Likewise, in the Ministry of Agriculture website, you've got the same map. The Ministry of Sports website, the same map. Uh, and at Fatah events, this is a Fatah event, and they've got this map in the background uh, with the Palestinian flag again over all of Israel. And again, we see it's coming from the top. Mahmoud Abbas holding up this map, and his newspaper defined this picture. President Abbas holds up a stolen model of the map of Palestine. Not of Israel and the PA, no, this is Palestine, this is the message that comes across. And Mahmoud Abbas, likewise, just a month ago, here he was sitting on the stage of an event of the Fatah. And here's the symbol of the Fatah. It's not just the map, but you have the two machine guns and the hand grenade over the map, symbolizing the armed and uh, liberation of what they call Palestine and the destruction of Israel. And this is Abbas. He would never again do this in the United States. Now, because the Palestinian Authority controls the newspapers, we see the identical messages coming through, even in things like crossword puzzles. So for example, here's a clue, Palestinian city, and the answer is Jaffa. Modern city in occupied Palestine, the solution is Tel Aviv. And we have in one crossword puzzle, Palestinian city, Tel Aviv, then Tiberias, and then Jaffa, all in the official paper owned by the Palestinian Authority. Now, in order to justify this denial of Israel's right to exist and the denial of Israel's existence, the Palestinian Authority has created an alternate history. And in this alternate history, the Palestinians have seven, eight, sometimes nine thousand year old history, and the Jews were never in, this, in the land of Israel. There never was a Jewish history, there never was a Jewish temple. They used the expression, Hekal Mazum, the false temple, fictitious temple, alleged temple, we've heard it. Dozens of times, we hear it dozens of times uh, every month in the Palestinian Authority coming from the leadership. Now, I'll give you a couple of examples of this. This is from the Minister of Religion. History proves the Arab, Islamic, and Palestinian rights to this land. And this proves all the Israeli claims that they have a religious and historical rights in Islam. Here's another very interesting one. This is a scholar from Birzeit University, and this appears in the official Palestinian paper. He said that the idea of Zionism is the establishment of a national home for Jews in Palestine and the invention of a new nationality known as the Jewish nation. And that the first to propose this idea was Theodore Herzl, who spoke in his book about the ideas of establishing a Jewish state. Here they're denying there ever was a Jewish nation until Theodor Herzl came up with it. So this is their message, total rewriting of history. The Jewish people were a religion, never had a nation, never had a history in the land. And these are just two amongst hundreds and hundreds of examples that you can find uh, of this, and many of them are on our website. Now here you have a fascinating example likewise. Here's the chief religious justice at that time in the Palestinian Authority, creating a total lie about archaeological finds in Jerusalem. <laughs> No Jewish holy sites in Jerusalem, of course, again, ridiculous, but this is the ongoing message internally to their people. It doesn't have to have any relationship to reality, but this is the ongoing indoctrination. To show you again that this is at the top, we have some a speech that was said in the name of Netanyahu just last month by his advisor. And listen to what he said, you Israelis are incidental in history.
Okay, you Jews are incidental in history. Of course, this is a total inversion here, giving themselves a 9,000 year old history, 7,000 years BC, and denying Israel's history in the land. Uh, again, and it's, it's very significant, he ends, we are the owners of history. This is we own, we are the owners, it's ours, the land is ours. That's the message that they're trying to give the people. Israel has no right to exist, it's all theirs. Now, this has fascinating ramifications. Because it not only denies Israel's right in the land and presence, it not only denies Israel's traditions, it also denies Christian tradition. Because if the Jews never were here, and if there never was a temple, then of course Jesus couldn't have walked in the temple, and of course Jesus couldn't have been a Jew. So this is what the Palestinians teach, and we have many examples of this on our website. Okay. So we believe in him as a Muslim prophet just like Muhammad is. So they're denying the legitimacy of Judaism, denying the legitimacy of Christianity and the denying both of the history traditions and creating and replacing it with a fictitious Palestinian history that of course never existed. So all of this is done in the name of denying. What's also interesting is they're actually even denying Islamic tradition because in the Quran it talks about the Jews living in the land of Israel, in the Quran it talks about the two temples being destroyed in the 17th chapter so that even Islamic tradition is denied by the Palestinians in order to create their political goal, which is to deny Israel's right to exist. Now, one of the most significant components of the conflict is that the Palestinians' authority in recent years has adopted the Hamas message that the, that the war with Israel is a religious war. And this is very significant. The world knows that Hamas is not a peace partner because they say this war is for Allah and we cannot compromise and we therefore can never accept Israel's right to exist. But what the world doesn't realize is that the Fatah has adopted this identical ideology and is teaching it to all the children in the education. I'll show you these examples. This is the Palestinian Authority Minister of Religion on TV and he says explicitly this is a religious war. And of course this is the current minister appointed by Mahmoud Abbas. <laughs> No one be mistaken that this rebat is a choice. No, it's a commandment. It requires you to rush and fulfill. It's a religious obligation to be involved in this war against Israel for the land. If we look in the school books, the rest of the information about the finding rebat can all be found there. And that's why this is so significant. Every Palestinian child today is being brought up with this message. This is from a 12th grade school book. And this is what they learn. The rebat for Allah, Islam urged jihad for Allah. And the Ribat for Allah is one of the actions related to jihad. It's a religious war. Palestine's people on their land are in one of the greatest of the Ribat. They get a great reward from Allah. And the residents are in a constant fight with their enemies. And when will this fight end? And this is critical. And they are found in Ribat until Resurrection Day. The residents of Palestine in particular are in Ribat until Resurrection Day. There can never be peace with Israel. You have this conflict eternally, you have this eternal conflict until the end of time, until resurrection, because Israel doesn't have a right to exist in the name of Islam. Now this is very significant. Palestinians are a very religious people. According to the latest polls, between, uh, between the two questions, are you religious or very religious? Over 90% of Palestinians answered yes, either religious or very religious, and only 1% said religion wasn't important to them at all. 1%. So 99% of Palestinians find religion important 
And now the children are being brought up in school to be told that their religion doesn't allow them to ever accept Israel and they have to fight them until the end of time. How can there be peace with a population where this is the way they're bringing up the children? So this is something that has been identified only as a Hamas ideology, but we see it black and white clearly in the Palestinian school books and amongst the Palestinian political leadership. So this is a very, very significant, significant message. These two first parts, non-recognition of Israel on the nationalistic grounds. Israel doesn't exist, doesn't have a right to exist. As well as non-recognition on the religious grounds, by themselves have the basis to eliminate any possibility of peace, and by themselves show that the Palestinian Authority, Fatah, has not yet honestly joined the peace process with Israel because they could not be teaching these messages to their people and their children if they were involved in a sincere peace process with the State of Israel. In addition, there's a whole other category of hate promotion that the Palestinian Authority is involved in, and that's demonization and hate incitement. And I want to show you what we mean by this. These are all issues that aren't even related to the issues of land very often. Sometimes they are, like here. So, for example, we get vicious uh, hate-promoting images regularly in the Palestinian uh, media. This is from a uh, Palestinian daily newspaper. This is the image of the Jew, the demonic Jew, uh, who in 1948 created Israel and killed, killed the Palestinians. You see the skulls here, of course, a very, very uh, hateful, hateful picture. Uh, we also get lots of messages that are totally, totally contrived. There are a whole series of libels that the Palestinian Authority has created. So, for example, Here's one, Israel is spreading AIDS and drugs amongst Palestinians, uh, and the person who said this is no one less than the person in the PA in charge of fighting drugs, the anti-drug general, the uh, general directorate. So this is coming from the top, Israel is spreading AIDS and drugs amongst Palestinians. Israel is spreading prostitution and drugs. Who said this? The advisor to the prime minister. Israel is trading in body parts of Palestinians. And who said this? This was said by the Minister of Prisoners. Again, all leadership. This isn't the problem of minister. This isn't the problem of media. It's a problem of leadership because those are the ones who are who are tracking the messages in the Palestinian media. Now here's an incredible one from just a couple of months ago in the official paper, again owned by the PA. Israeli doctors also carry out medical medical experiments on prisoners. There are detention centers which fall under military administration. They resemble the detention camps during the Nazi period. Okay, so Israeli camps are like two days later, they took this to another level. Again, just a couple of months ago. Slow death is the Israeli system for exterminating prisoners. The Israeli jailers attempt to imitate the Nazis, the German Nazis, who were the first to use prisoners as guinea pigs for testing the weapons and the deadly drugs which they developed. The Nazi German Dr. Joseph Mengele was the most famous among them. So here they are saying Israel is doing the same as Nazis. Of course, not based on any reality. Anybody who wants to can go onto the Red Cross website and they'll see there that every year they visit all of the Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. They've never, ever, ever made any claim like this. Just the opposite is true. Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jail are treated very, very well, exceedingly well. But yet this is the kind of messaging the Palestinian leadership is giving to their people just to create hatred of Israelis. This is something also very striking that is very significant here uh, to an American audience. This is written by the editor-in-chief of the paper owned by the PA. PA was of course horrified by the warm applause and the warm reception that Prime Minister Netanyahu had when he spoke in Congress and this is what the editor-in-chief of the official paper wrote. Anyone watching what took place in Congress during Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech would likely be nauseated because these congressmen and senators lost their dignity and looked like riffraff. The disgraceful applause and the shameful standing ovations 31 times as if they had hemorrhoids and Zionist impaling stakes in their backsides. Nothing less than this coming from the editor-in-chief of the Palestinian Authority. So this is the kind of demonization uh, that we get coming through. Palestinians, we said before, teach that the, the Western Wall, the Western Wall was never part of the Jewish, the Temple Mount. It couldn't be part of the Temple Mount because there never was a temple. That's their message. However, they teach that the Western Wall is the Western Wall of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's a Palestinian, I'm sorry, it's an Islamic holy site. Because it's an Islamic holy site, they say Jews shouldn't have any right to go and defile an Islamic holy site. This video, which is part of a documentary, it appeared on Rosh Hashanah, 
this past year, and look how they describe Jews praying at the Western Wall. Okay, we look from a distance, they see Islamic holiness. The Western Wall is said to be Islamic holiness, but when they come close, they see sin and filth, the Jews praying at the wall. So this, again, is a kind of hate message that comes through um, in the Palestinian Authority. Now, one of the most horrific libels of the Palestinian Authority is that Israel killed Yasser Arafat. Now, it's a horrific libel because Yasser Arafat was the person who literally single-handedly created the Palestinian people. Uh, he's their hero, he's their leader, he was their first, uh, not only PLO leader, but also the Palestinian Authority. And they have been saying since he got sick that Israel poisoned him and this libel that Israel poisoned Arafat's been going on for years. Here's just one example of it. But what's most significant of this, and throughout we're always looking about these messages, how children respond to these messages. Here we see a fascinating series of interviews with Palestinian children. This was in honor of the anniversary of Arafat's death. This was broadcast on Palestinian TV in 2009 and in 2010. And listening to these children, you see how deep the problem is that we have with the next generation of Palestinian youth. I don't know what he died from, but I know it was the Jews. What this reminds us of, this reminds us of what happened in the Middle Ages, when the Jews were so demonized that when people started dying from a plague and somebody said, you know, the Jews must have poisoned the wells, everybody was willing to believe. Because if something bad happened, they thought it must have been the Jews. And that's what this boy is saying here. He has heard so much demonization about Jews for so many years, that if Arafat died, he doesn't know what he died from, but he knows that it must have been the Jews. And this is the tragic result of Palestinian education, of Palestinian youth, that a child could say, it must have been the Jews, I don't even know what, but it must have been the Jews. And again, this is tragic because it impacts on Palestinian youth, it impacts on Israeli youth, and of course, it impacts and almost eliminates the possibility of having peace in the next generation um, with the Palestinian youth. Okay, for the part four, I'll turn the microphone over to Nanjak. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm going to take you uh, back a little bit to the statement by Hillary Clinton that Itamar mentioned in the beginning. Uh, one of the preconditions uh, put on the Palestinians, or one of the demands that they should um, comply with before even entering into peace talks and before the U.S. government was ready to work with the Palestinians, was among uh, one of the three was a non-commitment to violence. Um, the examples I'm going to show you now uh, will demonstrate that violence and um, the uh, the advocating violence and glorification of terrorism is still very much part of Palestinian society and it's something, it's a message that's actively still being communicated by the Palestinian leadership to the Palestinian people. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, we see uh, again uh, through the media as a window how these messages are communicated to the people. Um, this is from a PLO cultural festival. Um, this was uh, one um, performance that was included uh, by the organizers in this uh, festival, um, which glorifies violence. <laughs> It continues like this for about five minutes and you see there's uh, first the, the message of um, 
the glorification of the weapon, uh, no one can remove the weapon from my hand, but also of the, of the self-sacrifice, he who offers his blood doesn't care if his blood flows upon the ground, the, the glorification of dying uh, for the liberation of Palestine. So um, the, the Palestinian Authority liked this performance so much that it wasn't just performed once and, and broadcast on TV, it was broadcast seven times and they had the composer of the song interviewed in a studio and the, the band that performed it and as you saw they were dancing with rifles so violence very prominent theme in this performance um, another very popular band uh, Ala Shakin band which is a Palestinian band um, has been become very popular with another song uh, also promoting violence um, that goes like this <laughs> As you see, um, the words are in Lod were poems, in Ramla were grenades, and later on we replaced bracelets with weapons, and this actually echoes messages that we saw during the Intifada, um, the, terror, the Palestinian terror campaign from 2000 to 2005. Palestinian TV would have music videos directed at children where you saw children coming out of their houses with toys in their hands. They'd throw their toys away and you'd see the children pick up stones and throw them at Israelis. So this we replaced bracelets with weapons. It's a, a message that echoes throughout the history of the Palestinian Authority. The song ends with the words, pull the trigger, we shall redeem Jerusalem and Nablus and the country. So a direct um, advocacy of, of violence. Um, this band uh, was so significant in the eyes of the Palestinian Authority that uh, a few months ago, or in the end of, of last year, Chairman Abbas, he actually uh, announced that they would become a national institution. So uh, legitimacy to this band and the contents of their songs from the highest levels. Um, I think a month later, a member of the Fatah Central Committee, uh, Taufik Tirawi, he awarded them the Freedom Award. Uh, and I think it was even in the presence of Prime Minister Salam Fayyad. So a band being rewarded instead of uh, we having, we should have the Palestinian leaders um, you know, distancing themselves from this and say, we, we don't promote violence, we promote peace. Um, uh, instead, they went and honored the band by naming them a national institution. Uh, music videos, uh, as Itama mentioned, is one tool to promote messages to the people from the leadership. Um, this is another music video on Palestinian Authority TV um, that glorifies uh, the rifle as a brother. We treat the rifle as a brother, like a very, very strong statement, like what could be more dear to you than a brother, so the rifle becomes your brother, a very strong statement uh, of violence. Um, the, the Fatah Central member that I just mentioned that turned this band, uh, gave them the Freedom Award, he also said at one occasion, our people will not lay down the rifle until our land is liberated. So violence very much part of the, the general discourse on the leadership level. Um, and uh, I think, I don't remember if Itama mentioned it, but we, we look at what we call the input, what the leaders are saying to the people, but we also look at the output, how the people in the street, for example, in spontaneous interviews, how they um, repeat these messages, or if they're repeated and how they're repeated. And one thing we look at uh, with particular interest is how children uh, talk when they're interviewed and when they're um, when, this, when they're uh, given the choice to sing a song on TV, what songs they know by heart, what they chose, what they choose to sing, what they choose to talk about, and this is one um, one example of two children. This was uh, PA TV decided to um, they honored a terrorist, uh, a woman who's serving three life sentences for driving a suicide bomber to his target. Um, she's serving three life sentences for that, and PATV wanted to pay tribute to her by visiting her family's home. And these are her two nieces 
and they were uh, offered to dedicate a song to her and this is the song they chose. <laughs> Now what's significant about this is as horrifying it is, you see two, two little girls singing I want to fight, I want to carry a machine gun, uh, we shall strike Israel. You see the first girl starts the song and then after a few, a few lines the second girl joins in because she knows this song, you can see they know it by heart. We don't know where they were taught this but obviously it's not just a song that they heard once, it's something that they've heard over and over again and picked up somewhere in school, at home, we don't know. But the fact is that this is a song that they can sing spontaneously um, and also that that's the, the song that they chose. I don't know about your children, I, I think my children wouldn't know a song like this. Um, so very significant output um, and we see this as a result of the messages that are being put into the children uh, through the various messages of, of uh, means of communication that the Palestinian leadership controls. Um, this is another example of uh, a girl on, uh, again on a show on PATV who dedicates a song uh, to her uncle who is imprisoned in Israel. He's uh, serving a life sentence, uh, an Islamic Jihad commander. And she chooses to sing a song about Shahada, about dying as a martyr for Allah. It's also something that we um, have seen being actively taught to children as a value, dying for Allah in the, in the struggle to liberate Palestine. Again, very significant uh, coming from a young girl. Also, one of the lines in the song was uh, the Shaheed, you know, the martyr who dies for Allah is Allah's beloved. And in a religious society, which the Palestinian society is a very religious society, this carries enormous weight. When you're as a child are told that if you die as a martyr for Allah, you'll be Allah's beloved, that's a very strong message for a small child. Um, <clears throat> Another way of communicating uh, the, uh, the value of violence and the violence as, um, as, as a, a legitimate tool uh, is we see it in the honoring and the glorifying of terrorists. Earlier, during uh, the Palestinian terror campaign, for example, we would find very explicit calls uh, to go and kill Jews. Um, we'd have sermons in the mosques and broadcast on TV in which the preachers would directly say, and they would quote the Quran, go and kill the Jews, go and kill the enemies, the Jews are enemies, go and kill them. Now, we publicized it a lot. It got a lot of publicity uh, um, globally. And in the end, the Palestinian Authority realized that, that they couldn't go on uh, advocating killing Jews so openly. So they took this uh, almost out of the curricula and out of the, the public uh, television and, and uh, newspapers. But we see that they're actually communicating the same message in a more subtle way. Now we don't see an explicit call for violence and for killing Jews, but we see a tremendous honoring of terrorists, of people who have actually done and, and turned theory into act by killing Israelis, killing Jews, by suicide uh, terror attacks and other attacks. And I'm going to show you a few examples uh, of that. We've made um, a case study of one particular terrorist who have become a tremendous and enormous role model for Palestinians. Uh, her name is Dalal Mugrabi, and she led a terror attack um, that took place in 1978, over 30 years ago. It's uh, referred to as the Coastal Road Massacre, um, at which uh, terrorists came from Lebanon and they uh, went ashore uh, near Haifa into Israel. 
They, uh, on the way, uh, they killed uh, um, American photographer Gail Rubin, who was taking nature pictures on the beach as they um, went ashore. They continued and hijacked the bus, and the result of this was that 37 uh, civilians uh, died in this terror attack. Today, until today, it's the most lethal attack in Israel's history. And this woman, who led the attack and, uh, and herself got killed in the end by uh, Israeli soldiers, she's become a huge role model for Israel's, Israel, uh, sorry, for Palestinian society. And these are just a few examples. Uh, this is uh, the remains of the bus uh, after the hijacking. We've had um, Fatah has named summer camps after her in 2008, and she's referred to as the Shahida, as the martyr for Allah which is um, a very honorable title to receive. Um, this was by the Fatah movement. We had a summer camp uh, named after her last year. We've had a football tournament named after her for youth. We've had a summer camp activities named after her, dedicated to her. Um, we've had high school graduation ceremonies that were under the auspices of the chairman Abbas himself. Uh, and there was a representative uh, of Abbas present at the, at the ceremonies and he reviewed the heroic life of Della Mugabe, the, the martyr. Now, um, she was 19 years old when she led this operation and, and you might call that quite an achievement, but she's only known for this terrorist attack and that's why she's being honored. Mahmoud Abbas himself also funded a computer center two years ago named after her, um, a contribution from the chairman's uh, office. Two Palestinian schools are named after her, one in Gaza, one in the West Bank. Um, and um, on the anniversary, I'm oh, sorry, last year um, the Palestinian Authority uh, decided to name a square after her. She was such a prominent Palestinian uh, figure that they wanted to name a square after her. Uh, to eternalize her memory. You may remember that this was um, announced in December 2009 and then in March last year they wanted to have the inauguration ceremony and that coincided with, uh, with Biden's visit to, uh, to Israel and to the Palestinian Authority and uh, we publicized it in the end. There was so much noise about it that the Palestinian Authority decided um, not to do it uh, and then instead they went and let Fatah do it because they have this uh, game that they play that the Palestinian Authority has to recognize Israel and has to behave but then Fatah as a party can go and do the same things and the bottom line is that now there is a square named after Dalla Mugrubi. Uh, on top of that um, the, Palestinian, sorry, the Palestinian Authority decided that on the anniversary of her 50th birthday, the day that she would have turned 50, um, they decided to have a birthday party for her and this was also under the auspices uh, of President of uh, Chairman Mahmoud Abbas and this is a report that was on the Palestinian uh, evening news. Again, not so long ago, uh, half a year ago, at the anniversary of the Fatah movement, um, they also honored Dalal Mugrabi as one of the movement's uh, greatest heroes. They had music videos uh, honoring her on TV. I'm just going to show you one of them. Uh, this is one of them. <laughs> So this, the coast was stormy with the glory of Delal. You remember I told you they went ashore on the coast uh, near Haifa. Um, and this we saw uh, throughout during the week of the anniversary of the Fatah movement. There was uh, lots of honoring of Dalla Mugrabi. The same happens on March 8th every year, the International Women's Day. We see Dalla Mugrabi mentioned as this great symbol of, uh, of uh, women freedom because uh, there was one actually a member of uh, Fatah and a member of parliament. She said, oh look at Dalla Mugrabi, she's a great role model. She went ahead with the operation and she didn't even ask her dad for permission. So she's also being used as a symbol of, uh, of women liberation even. 
Um, just one last example of uh, the use of Della Mugrubi as a role model. This was a clip that, that was part of a huge media campaign that was broadcast on 50 different TV stations in the Arab world, including on Palestinian TV. It was called the Model Woman, and the campaign's goal was to promote women in society, to have more uh, female leaders, uh, and to, to um, promote women, uh, female role models. And one of the role models that was mentioned in, in the campaign was uh, Della Mugrabi, uh, and she was mentioned as a, a hero um, fighting against the enemy and uh, the symbol of martyrdom. What's interesting about this ad is that when we checked the, the website of the campaign, we discovered that the UN was actually involved in this, that they had sponsored um, the, the organization that was behind this campaign. So as soon as we publicized it, the UN reacted and they said, no, we're not part of this. We uh, gave them advice two years ago and our name still appears on the website. We don't know what their involvement was, but today the, um, the website doesn't feature the, the UN logo anymore. But this is also a, an example of the work that we do at Palestinian Media Watch. We expose these things and uh, luckily sometimes uh, people do uh, come back and react. Um, another side of the promotion of violence and the glorification of terror is how the Palestinian Authority um, behaves or relates to Palestinians who are imprisoned in Israel for, uh, for killing Israelis or for terror attacks or for attempts to commit uh, terror attacks. Um, they honor these prisoners and they eulogize them when they die and they have memorial ceremonies also of uh, past terrorists. And again, like we've uh, shown you, it's the leadership, it's coming from the top. This is an article in the Palestinian paper of how the Palestinian uh, Minister for Prisoners honored uh, a mother because four of her sons are serving life sentences in Israeli prison uh, for killing Israelis. And you can see here, he said about her, um, he gave her this award that had the names of her four sons inscribed. And we have to pay her respect and honor her because it is she who gave birth to the fighters and she deserves that we bow to her in salute and in honor. A mother of four terrorists. And here we noted down what they did. Um, they're serving all together. Sorry. They're serving, uh, one is serving si seven life sentences, one five, one four, one two life sentences. And this is what a minister in the government, one who is appointed by Abbas, uh, decided uh, was deserving of honor. Um, just uh, six, six weeks ago, we found this article in the paper um, that told about how in Bethlehem a tree of freedom was um, unveiled in, in, uh, in a public place. And this tree of freedom, uh, it, had, um, it was unveiled with photographs of prisoners sentenced to life imprisonment hanging from its branches. So it had pictures of Palestinians serving life sentences uh, in Israel. Um, and um, it was agreed that it would be placed in a prominent location in the city of Bethlehem as befitting the prisoners and their sacrifice. So again, complete honor uh, to terrorists and to people who have uh, killed Israelis. Um, we also see it um, in the fact that ministers and other Palestinian Authority officials, they visit the homes of Palestinian prisoners um, to honor their families, to give them awards. Here, um, the Bethlehem district governor, he visited a family uh, of a prisoner and he gave them gift packages of sweets during the visit. Um, very, very strong um, display of, of honoring um, violence. Now, you probably heard um, the Palestinian leaders uh, refer to as saying that they're against violence uh, and then they have made this commitment to nonviolence. Um, Itman mentioned the name uh, or the word deception uh, and duplicity is another word that's very um, fitting to the, to the messages that we see coming from the Palestinian Authority. Um, here is one example uh, that relates to the square uh, named after Del Mugari that I just mentioned. Uh, not so long ago, uh, Chairman Abbas was interviewed on Israeli TV uh, and obviously to an Israeli or Western audience and about the square, he says, he said, there's no doubt I'm against it. I condemn this action of naming the square. However, we, we documented that a year earlier, and we also published it at the time, when there was talk about the square, Abbas himself, the same man, said, of course we want to name a square after her. 
we carried out a military action. That's how you refer to the terror attack. It was a military action. Can I then later renounce all that we have done? So to a Palestinian audience, he was in favor. He defended the fact that they wanted to name a square after her. But a year later, to the Israeli audience, he, uh, he denied it. He said, I'm against it. The same duplicity we see from Salam Fayyad, the Prime Minister, who in the eyes of the West is uh, this very moderate, very uh, progressive, um, clean man. Um, you may remember that uh, I think a month ago there was a bomb that exploded in Jerusalem um, near the, the central station. And Fayyad, very quickly, um, to the Western media, he condemned this uh, as a, a terror operation. He said, I condemn this terror operation in the harshest terms, no matter who stands behind it. And it's actually one of the first times that he's even used the word terror. So this was seen by the Western media as a fantastic step forward that he immediately went and condemned uh, the fact that someone had placed a bomb near a Jerusalem uh, bus station. However, um, the very same day when he spoke in Arabic to Palestinians on Palestinian radio, we heard him say the following, I will not fail to mention with honor and admiration the resolve of the female prisoners, the fighters. And then he mentioned four particular uh, female prisoners, one who drove a suicide bomber to an attack killing three in 2002, one who drove another suicide bomber who managed to kill two, to kill two and injure dozens, one who placed a bomb at the central bus station, not in Jerusalem, but in Tel Aviv. And the fourth one, one who smuggled the bomb into Israel for a suicide terror operation. So the very same day, he glorified the placing of a bomb in a station in the morning and in the, to the Arab audience, to the Palestinian audience. In the afternoon, he went and condemned the exact same thing when he was facing a Western audience. So again, we're showing that there are two different messages, one in English to the, for international consumption and one in Arabic for internal consumption. Now, one last thing. Another way of, of demonstrating or com communicating that the prisoners are heroes of society is this um, law that we found, there was an announcement not so long ago in the Palestinian paper about the authorization of this law that stipulates that the PA, through the general budget, uh, is paying uh, salaries, monthly salaries, to uh, all uh, prisoners in Israeli prisons. And the law says, among other things, Every prisoner will be paid a uniform sum linked to the cost of living index as a monthly expenditure. Every prisoner will be granted a monthly salary to be paid to him or to his family. The salary will be paid to the prisoner from the date of his arrest and a special supplement will be paid to prisoners from Jerusalem and from the interior. The interior is uh, the word that the Palestinian Authority used to describe um, Israel uh, what we call inside the green line, uh, instead of saying Israel, they call it the, the Palestinian interior. So um, the general budget is paying salaries to terrorists, um, but not only, and there is an, an earlier law that defines who a prisoner is, and they call it everyone who is struggling against occupation. So we're not talking about car thieves, we're talking about um, uh, uh, prisoners in prison for terror offenses. Um, now, not only that, this is a list again, uh, written in the law, that uh, determines how great a salary a prisoner will receive. And as you can see here, the longer term you serve, the greater your salary. So the harsher sentence you receive, and I mean, of course the, the sentence follows or uh, goes according to the crime, so the worse a crime, the higher a salary. So anyone imprisoned uh, 30 years or more, he'll receive the highest salary of 12,000 shekels. And I think a dollar today is like three and a half shekels, so you can do the calculations. But um, <clears throat> the point here, and relevant for you, is that the end of the law said these regulations will be implemented from January 1st, 2011 on the basis of available sources of funding. So it means whenever the budget, the general budget, has enough money in it, it will pay salaries to these terrorists. Now, who's funding the general budget of the PA? <clears throat> this is a list of, it's not a complete list, this is a list of, of donors that the Palestinian Authority media has reported uh, itself. So you see the European, is, uh, well, the European Union is, uh, is a generous contributor with 158 million euros. Uh, you see even, even nicer is the United States down here with the 225 million dollars. Um, so uh, the point of this is that as long as they're funding, 
the Palestinian budget will be able to pay tribute to these prisoners and honor terrorism by paying them a monthly salary. Now, um, what I've shown you is really just uh, a, a little bit of many more, doc many more examples that, that I could be showing you. Violence has been that you have almost a, an entire society thinks it's, it's justified, it's legitimate to go and kill young people studying in a library. <clears throat> now, the total of all that we've been showing you now, that Itamar told you, he showed you examples of the non-recognition of Israel's existence, its right to exist, denial of Jewish history, the demonization of Jews and Israelis, that Jews uh, and Israelis are spreading drugs, spreading AIDS, killed Arafat, are committing uh, medical experiments on prisoners, everything bad you can even imagine, uh, and on top of that the glorification of violence and the promotion and the glorification of terrorists leads to uh, a poll like this. The results of all this is uh, like this. The, this was a poll uh, done less than a year ago, and the first statement asked Palestinians, and it was both in the West Bank and in Gaza, uh, the best goal is for a two-state solution that keeps two states living side by side. And you see here a total of 30% said they agreed with this statement. However, the second statement, the same people asked, the real goal should be to start with two states, but then move to it all being one Palestinian state. And that statement received 60% support from the Palestinian uh, people being polled. So very, very um, scary uh, picture. You've seen all the messages coming from the Palestinian leadership. And I think this poll is a very good indicator of the result of these messages. And now I'm just going to round off and then we can open up to some questions. Um, we started by saying that there is this duplicity um, and uh, there are two messages, one in English, one in Arabic for internal consumption. And um, we think it's very important that we be aware of this duplicity that um, that polls like this be taken seriously and that maybe we should not take at face value what the Palestinians are, are saying in English. Um, I'm going to invite Ithamar back up to answer questions and um, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much and hold your hands up for questions and Please, questions only, no statements, quantifications. So, how can the end result of this be anything but violence? When children are taught from infancy to hate and to love violence, there can be no other outcome, it seems to me. And does our administration and our State Department know all of this? And if so, how can they be pushing for uh, supposedly a peaceful result with two states living together? Well, I think first of all, is this working anymore? Yeah? It's working? Yeah. Uh, I think first of all, uh, I think um, uh, there is a solution. It's not an easy one. It'll take time, but the, the, the key word is peace education. And obviously we cannot have a peace process, we cannot have a peace agreement before we have peace education in the Palestinian Authority. Now we've shown you examples from the, the last few years. We could show you examples from the last 10 years. And I think uh, my estimate is that it will take at least just as many years to undo it. It's a sad statement, but I still think it's, it's, it's a solution. Um, your second part of the question is if the administration is aware of this. Um, I think they are. I'm not so sure that uh, they think it's very convenient to know this. Um, but yes, they are aware. Do you want to add to that? What's that? Who's going to do that? Well, first of all, I think that the funders, like uh, your own country, like the European Union and many other countries, they have, they possess an enormous uh, leverage and I think also responsibility that to, to um, condition the funding on some changes. Like, for, for example, one simple, simple change would be to put Israel on the map. Any map appearing in a school book, in a, in a public office, in a ministry, should, 
should have Israel on it, and, and the kids should see Israel next to Palestine. Uh, that would be one thing, where a, good th a good place to start. But I think that the donor countries uh, that are so involved in the peace process, they have an enormous responsibility and also an opportunity to, to help the Palestinians um, you know, turn this around and start educating for peace and, and not continue this uh, hate promotion. Do you want to add? That's cool. <laughs> The uh, television shows that we've seen, are they broadcast to Palestinians that are living within Israel, or are they um, somehow banned from uh, Israel proper? Both, all of Palestinian television goes out by satellite dish to the entire Arab world. And I would say that amongst Israeli Arabs today, a significant percentage of them do have Arabic language satellite dishes so that these messages are going to Israeli Arabs as well. Um, we've seen in the last few years uh, an unfortunate uh, radicalization amongst Israeli Arabs, a lot of anti-Israel uh, anti activities amongst Israeli Arabs, people like Raid uh, Salah, head of the Islamic movement, has been in jail a number of times, he has a tremendous following, he has tremendous support, uh, and there's no doubt that the the, the messages of the Palestinian leadership to the, Palestinian, to the Israeli Arab population, not calling them Israeli Arabs, but calling them Palestinians of the interior, this is a very powerful message, and all of the hate messages that have been given to especially Israeli Arab youth, unfortunately we fear are being very successful, and Israel today has a population within it that does not really have allegiance at all to, the, to Israel, but has allegiance to something completely different, uh, the, some a Palestinian identity and some Palestinian goals. We, the same way that we in our office have a satellite dish that we see this, any Israeli family buys a satellite dish, puts it on, and they get this, and they do, they get it. Because this, this is the same satellite dish that will supply them with Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, uh, all the Arab stations that they want to receive. And YouTube. And in fact, as Nan points out, this is also available, by the way, Europeans. The Arabs, big speaking people in Europe can watch this as well, as well as the United States. Thank you. The second question is, why is there so much attention on this two-state solution when we know that in Islam, Jew hatred is part of Islam? If all the Palestinians were suddenly woke up tomorrow and didn't hate Jews, they would be attacked by their other Arab Muslim brethren in other Muslim countries. So it's like, considering all that I've seen tonight, it's like, why are we... Why is so many, why is Israel, why is America so focused in on a two-state solution that will never work? I think that Israel feels it's important uh, to continue looking for peace. Um, what you said, by the way, about uh, Islam never accepting uh, Israel, there seems to be that that's the prevalent opinion today. However, there are Muslims in the world today. There are people like Sheikh Palachi in Italy. I don't know if you know Sheikh Palachi in Italy. He goes around preaching that the Quran accepts Israel and recognizes Israel's right to exist. Sheikh Palachi is not very prominent today in the, in the Muslim world, but Sheikh Palachi could be prominent. So what we're hoping is that given some kind of, uh, of, of intense re-education, which hasn't started yet, it hasn't started yet, but the same way education and hate education has poisoned the Palestinian population, as Nan said, should there be a Palestinian leader who tomorrow would reverse this and spend the next 10, 15 years re-educating the population, uh, then hopefully we'd have some peace. It's critical that we come to the world with a message that there has to be, we can't say there's going to be war forever. There has to be something. But we're saying, don't go ahead with a ridiculous peace process if the Palestinians are doing this. Insist on real peace. Insist on the cessation of this. And then after we see a Palestinian leadership that is truly educating for peace, then we can talk about having a peace process. I have yes. one question. Um, I, I saw a piece of your testimony to Congress 
on the internet the other day and Hillary Clinton's reaction to it, which was sort of like Claude Rain's reaction in Casablanca that she was shocked, shocked, the gambling is going on in the facility. You know, she was just really like, I can't believe all this is happening. Uh, is there some way that we can get these kinds of videos disseminated more widely on our televisions? I mean, because if the national population of the United States knew all this was going on, I okay, so let, let me say two things. First of all, um, the press, con the, the hearing that you saw uh, in Congress, that was the um, Education Committee, the Appropriations Subcommittee, uh, the uh, Education uh, Subcommittee of Appropriations. Uh, Hillary Clinton was participating in that uh, that hearing. We made a presentation showing how the Palestinians were brainwashing the children to be martyrs, um, and. Hillary Clinton participated and made the very strong statement. I want to show you one other strong statement from Hillary Clinton. This is a few years ago. We released a report on Palestinian school books. Then I want to tell you a little bit more about the, the political impact around the world. What's significant about Hillary Clinton's message here, they profoundly poison the minds of these children. We have presented this message, Nan and I, in, in not just the United States Congress, which is seen as friendly to Israel, but we have presented this in many, many parliaments throughout Europe. We've presented it uh, recently, uh, Nan spoke twice this past year in Danish parliament. We've spoken together in European parliament. We've spoken Norwegian, Swedish parliament, Italian parliament. And every place we go, we find shock by parliamentarians. We are convinced, and we find change in policy, change in opinions. Uh, we've even had change in legislation. You can't hear me. One of the things that we are convinced of at this point, most Americans or most Israeli supporters are very, uh, very, very frustrated and worried about Europe. We're optimistic about Europe because we're convinced that the, the, the uh, animosity toward Israel in Europe is based on ignorance. When European parliamentarians are shown proper information like this material, we see them turning around. And it's our hope that we can get this material out there more. Uh, right now we're preparing a book which deals with the entire last year in the Palestinian Authority. The book is called Deception. Uh, we're going to be releasing this with members of parliament in as many European parliaments as we can. We're hoping that this book with literally hundreds of pages of documentation, thousands of quotes on all these issues, is something that is going to turn Europeans around. We believe it is possible. Again, we believe that European animosity is because of ignorance and we're planning, hoping, to be able to turn that around. What about the possibility of basically, since you showed us where all the funding was coming from, what about cutting off the funding as long as they're lying? Making the funding conditional upon stopping the, the line? We're meeting uh, next week in Washington with um, Senator Daniel Inouye. He's the chairman of the Senate Foreign Affairs Appropriations Committee. Uh, we're going to be showing him some other material. This material, uh, we're going to be showing him the law that Nan had just presented to you, the one where Palestinian Authority is now giving salaries to all Palestinian prisoners. We're convinced, and we know this is the case, that uh, American funding today of the Palestinian Authority violates American law. Probably the letter is certainly the spirit, cert probably the letter of law as well. And we're hoping to work with the Appropriations Committee uh, and have the funding stopped. Um, you just mentioned you're speaking in Europe. What about smaller delegations going to the other members of the United Nations, each country by country of decision makers and their foreign policy? Uh, and how quickly did that it could be done if we were the size organization that we would like to be, we could do it. <laughs> uh, 
uh, and we're growing slowly and we're looking always for more support to be able to increase. We see the impact, but like I said, right now, the people who are going around, around the world are Nana and myself. We would like to double or triple the number of people who learn the material and can go around. Um, I have a question, I have a question about you talk about peace education. My understanding was in the Oslo, part of the Oslo Accords was a replacement of textbooks in Palestinian schools. And that they claimed they didn't have enough money, even with American funding, and that the U.S. actually offered to create and send the textbooks, and that that was rejected. Has there been any further movement? I mean, I agree that peace education is so vitally important, but it, I feel like we've made it a long time. The Palestinian Authority in its early years used uh, Jordanian and Egyptian school books. Starting from the year 2000, they replaced them one or two years every year. Today, they're using exclusively Palestinian Authority school books. All the hate messages that you saw were Palestinian produced books, so they can't blame anyone else anymore. The, the new Palestinian school books are different in one way. The old Palestinian school books, based on Jordanian books, were filled with not just anti-Israel hatred, but also filled with anti-Semitism. The new school books took out the anti-Semitism, but still continue to demonize and delegitimize Israel. And like I said, and like we've said, you cannot have peace in the future if this is the education. I wish you, wish you God speed in your wonderful work. Uh, and I, my question has to do with the mindset of the Israelis. Uh, I'm a total American, and uh, I ask for a person, and I'm of the mind that I'll go to my grave, and they'll be continuing war forever. And my question is, what percentage of the Israelis feel as I do that war will be forever, given the um, Islam religion and what percentage are like yourself feel like uh, with eyes wide open possibly there's a way and what percentage feel like let's give up and make any peace we can get thank you <laughs> uh, you know uh, not only is it hard to answer about number of Israelis but I think if you ask an individual Israeli, on Sunday, he'll tell you there'll never be peace. On Monday, he'll tell you there has to be peace. And on Tuesday, he'll tell you in the morning there has to be and there won't be and there could be. Um, it's, you know, every, in Israel people want peace. Absolutely, definitely want peace. Uh, for years after the signing of the Oslo Accords, Israelis were willing to ignore everything that we were publicizing because they wanted peace so much, they didn't want to see this. It was uncomfortable, uh, as, as you heard. Uh, so that was, that was what was going on. Today, people are waking up. Today, the overwhelming majority of, of Israelis, uh, our material's gotten a lot of exposure. Every time another article comes out showing the quotes from the school books, the education, uh, more and more Israelis realize that the Palestinian Authority is not interested in peace and become more pessimistic about the chance of peace. However, I think that the majority of Israelis would still believe that if you had a significant attempt on the part of the Palestinian Authority to turn this around through education, you might have peace. Let me tell you something fascinating. In 1996, this is at the beginning of the period of the Palestinian Authority. The, the Oslo Accords were 93, Palestinian Authority was established in 94. In 1996, Palestinians basically were still just at the beginning of the Oslo period. Palestinians were asked in a poll to rate four different places in the world in democracy and human rights. United States, France, Palestinian Authority, and Israel. Do you know which place the Palestinians gave the best rating in the world in democracy and human rights in 1996? Israel. 78% of Palestinians gave Israel a positive rating. United States only got 65% positive, and France only got 55% positive. Israel, significantly the best in the world in democracy and human rights. Why? because there had been contact between Israelis and Palestinians from 1967 through, 19, through 1994. So all of those years of contact between Israelis and Palestinians made Palestinians believe that Israel was the best in the world in democracy and human rights. That's why, that's why I'm hopeful that 
if you take out the poisoning of the minds of the Palestinians that we've seen all these last years and re-educate them and teach them exactly what Israel did for them during all those years. Teach them that the only ones who really helped the Palestinian population since since, since 19, who knows when, has really been Israel. Israel established their hospitals. Israel established the universities. Israel really helped them. In 1996, they remembered it and they knew it. Today, they don't anymore. So, a massive re-education campaign, if it were ever to be undertaken, could turn this around. I don't believe people are inherently evil. I believe if Palestinians knew how good Israel was to them, that Israel really just wants peace, it could turn around. I'm not blind and overly optimistic. That change has not happened. Every day we see more educa hate education, more poisoning of minds. But, we're saying, the goal has to be not to throw out any hope of peace, but the goal has to be to try to put incredible pressure on the Palestinians today to stop the fictitious peace process, to demand real peace education. Let's see, real peace education for five years, six years, seven years. Let's see a Palestinian population that in polls accepts Israel's right to exist, instead of 60% seeing the solution, two states leading to the end of Israel. We see 90% of Palestinians accepting Israel's right to exist after an education campaign, then we have someone to talk to. I have a question. Um, I, I know this is, whenever I mention this, people kind of roll their eyes and say, oh, that train has left the station. But there's no such thing as a Palestinian people. So wouldn't that be a good place to start the education? <laughs> Because the world thinks that there really is a Palestinian people, and therefore, and they were uprooted by the Jewish people, and now, now they want. And so that there's some, if you really believe that, there's some, there's some reason to believe that. But we we're all using that word, Palestinian people. They have Palestine. They don't have Palestine. Is even a country. It was never a country. Wouldn't there be some value? I mean, you'd have to change the name of your group, but... <laughs> is, there, is there not any... Am I really beating a dead horse here? <clears throat> there are a couple of issues. One, I think it's critical, and we, we sometimes talk about this. In fact, in, the new, in our new book, we actually have a whole section on the origin of the word Palestine. And then we bring all the examples of Jews and Zionists in the last century who were actually the ones who were called Palestinians. We bring this in the book. We think it's important to know the history and it's important to know the truth about everything. And in fact, in fact, the, the idea of a Palestinian nation, most of the, the overwhelming majority of people who today call them Pal themselves Palestinians, this is well, well documented, came to the land of Israel uh, region, came to Palestine, what was then British Palestine, during the last century uh, because of the increased uh, uh, economic conditions and economic possibilities because of the growth of the land under Zionism. They came from Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, uh, and didn't really have a strong Palestinian identity uh, at that point. In fact, they had no Palestinian identity uh, uh, all through before the creation of Israel. The Israelis, I should say, the Jewish Zionists were the ones who used the term Palestine regularly. The Palestine Post turned into the Jerusalem Post, uh, and, and the Palestine National Bank was, in, it was a Jewish bank. Uh, so that Palestine last century, but, however, truth is one thing, today, uh, thanks primarily to terrorism and Yasser Arafat, the world has decided the Palestinian population themselves today, which they didn't in the past, believes that they're Palestinians. Uh, it's important to tell the truth, but if they want to call themselves Palestinians, we don't mind if they call themselves Palestinians, as long as they don't deny Israel's right to exist, as long as they don't erase our history, as long as they don't use that name to try to destroy us. Uh, again, theoretically, they could have started today to be a Palestinian people, and could, you know, could be a decent nation in the next you know, 100, 200, and forever be a, a Palestinian people and a Palestinian nation, even though they started, let's say, in 1965. Uh, it's important to know the past, but we're not going to argue about names because I think it would totally delegitimize any work we're trying to do. Among the countries you mentioned, you mentioned Jordan. I've seen maps that show Jordan as part of the Palestinian mandate. I think that's a fact that needs to get out more. Yeah. 
Again, it's true. It's all part of the, the history of the region. Jordan and Palestine were originally the mandate in 1922 already. It was given to, to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan to be Transjordan at the time. Uh, again, it's important historically. Today, it doesn't have that much significance in terms of what's happening today. Uh, again, because people, if you start talking about 1922, then no one's going to listen to you. What we're showing you are videos that happened last week, and that's what is important. Uh, what happened in 1922 is not going to change. It's, again, important historically. It's not going to change the political di diameter uh, uh, dimensions today. And I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, two more questions. Massive really attention to possibly bring them out you're looking for. I'm just wondering that would take a lot of resources. Have you explored any particular uh, avenues or you can find the kind of money you need to make something like this happen? The, the European Union, the United States, all the, uh, the Japanese, the, the individual European countries are giving so much money so much money to the Palestinian Authority, if they were interested in re-education, they would have no problem financing it. Rewriting the school books, changing Palestinian TV, uh, starting to teach, put Israel on the map, that is peanuts compared to the billions of dollars that are poured into them every year. That's not, that, finance isn't the problem. Desire and willingness is the problem. And the last question, please, Jude. What is the uh, reaction <coughs> of the uh, so-called Palestinian moderates toward this uh, brainwashing. I take, for example, uh, Sari Hussein. Okay? And uh, I think most people regard the, the voice, <coughs> used to be the voice of moderate. When you talk to him privately, what does he say about this uh, brainwashing? Well, after you arrange the meeting, I'll talk to him privately. <laughs> Uh, no, but I'm, I, I'll, I'll be serious with you. The, the voice of opinion in Hamas yeah. is probably half no. way. Right, no. because these people, these are the journalists, and they come and interview you to yep. show you what's happening. Uh, there are even people like Sarino Seba. Uh, we're finding, for example, Sarina Seba is the president of Al Quds University. We find an enormous amount of hate promotion and hatred, a denial of Israel's right to exist, and terror glorification happening at Al Quds University. Uh, a number of years ago, during the height of the terror campaign called Intifada, uh, Sarina Seba published a letter together with Hanan Ashrawi in the Al Quds newspaper where they called for the cessation of suicide bombings against civilians within Israel. What was their reasoning that Sari Nuseba and Hanan Shari wrote that they're against suicide bombings? Because they're damaging the interest of the Palestinian people. And then they continued that a military action is judged by its political results. So that even the so-called moderates in the Palestinian Authority, when they're speaking to their own people in Arabic, they're giving a completely different message. I'll say one final thing. There are, amongst Palestinians who we've met, very sincere moderates. And I'll give you one example. They, they are the people in power, but they do exist. And I don't think they're very large in number at this point. We don't know the exact percentages, but they're people like Khaled Abu Tome. I don't know if you know him. He used to be the editor of the PLO newspaper, Al Fajr. Today, he won't write for them because he totally rejects the principles and values of the Palestinian Authority. He writes for European newspapers. He writes, uh, he writes for the Jerusalem Post. We've spoken a number of times together in conferences in, in both in Israel as well as around the world, and he is constantly condemning. In fact, when he speaks after me, after this material has, has been shown to the, to the audience, he always talks about this being the reason why there's no peace and that we have to get rid of the hate education. So someone like Khaled Abu Tome is willing to say this is the reason there's no peace. How many people he represents in the Palestinian Authority, we don't know. We don't think it's very large right now. Uh, we don't know, though, for sure. Maybe, maybe there is a silent majority that nobody knows about that really hates this. Our hope is that through giving this message out over and over again uh, in the Palest I I around the world, pressure will be put on the Palestinian Authority so that somehow, some way, they will, some leader will come along who will change that message so that hopefully we can have peace in the next generation. Thank you. you want to say